especially now that it's done. Uh, the midterm, as I have mentioned a million times next week, the problems on the midterm will be closer to the problems you saw in this midterm, but there will be some... Uh, sorry, stop. Problems in the midterm will be closer to what you just saw in homework two, okay? But there will be stuff like homework one, so don't don't forget everything you just learned off of that. Are there any questions on that particular homework two? Something that you're dying to know? There'll be a key up sometime in the future because of the amazing GSI. Are you gonna send us the solution? Am I gonna send the answers so that you wrote? Are. There'll be a key up in the future. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure exactly when. Because um, we're, hand, yeah, we're grading it and handing it back around the same time as the midterm. So, unless, uh, well, I'll talk to the GSIs and see if they're all ambitious about getting this back to you on Tuesday. If that's possible. I'm not promising anything. The answer key will happen no matter what. Um, there's no, uh, uh, there's no office hours today, and we're going to end a little bit early because I have to go to the hospital and have somebody cut me open. I'm all excited about that. And I haven't had my coffee, so I'm not excited about that either. Just, this whole fasting thing is annoying. Um, it's been brought to my attention that the bureaucrats of the university and their infinite wisdom have got huge policies about privacy. Things like photos and emails and stuff like that on blog posts. So, what I've done immediately, there, there's three areas of concern. Number one, are you posting at all on my blog? I don't think anybody really cares about that. They're labeled as guest posts, they're your opinions, my opinions, your opinions, whatever. Number two, um, emails and na or names, but emails more importantly. I've eliminated all the emails from the posts that are already online. There will not be more emails. Has anybody who had a blog post swap received any email, especially a harassing type of email? Something helpful, potentially? Okay. Anybody else? So I'm basically going to assume that if those people want to correspond with you, they'll write a comment. Right? So that kind of sucks, but it's not a big, big deal. Photos. Some people are, well, some people don't like the idea of their photos being up at all. Some people don't like their UC photos. So there's, what I'm going to say right now is that the default at the moment is your name and your photo. If you do not want your photo at all, or you want a different photo, because it's a better photo, <laughs> then you can send it to me. Okay? Some people don't actually have photos listed on the UC database, whatever. They're not going to have a photo. I, and a lot of the people that I talk to, love the little photos because it kind of links a name and a face and the person who's writing to you. So I think it's really nice having photos up there. If you're, if you're worried about stalkers might find you and stuff like that, then uh, please send me an email. Okay? So remember, your grade is depending on turning in a blog post. It can go up completely anonymously. But I think it looks better to have your name and have your face. And then we won't have emails. Is that okay? Does anybody have any questions or anything about that? If you need to email me on the side about this because it's some kind of concern, please do. Do not go to the UC bureaucracy. It will take forever to get anything done. I have to do like a two-hour online sexual harassment thing. I can't wait to do that. Right. Any other open questions? <coughs> Not because of this blogging, because everybody has to. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Is it possible for a firm that, what's the exact wording? <coughs> controls the market to produce zero units of the good. This was a bit of a tricky question. So, it is always possible to produce zero, in a sense, because you control the market, right? When, when, so the, the, the answer is essentially yes, but why? Why would a firm that controls the market actually never produce anything? If their marginal cost of producing the first unit is higher than the, where the demand curve cuts the price. Mm -hmm. So the price of any unit is actually above the price. The cost is, is lower, higher than the benefit. Is that to be like all at all um, levels of quantity? Because there is a level of quantity that's above the cost and then the price that's at that level. It's kind of like a new technology. Uh, wait, say expensive. it again. Would it be at, the, if the price is uh, greater at any, at all um, levels of quantity? Because if there was one level, let's like say, for some reason at the fifth one, you know, it broke. I don't understand. I haven't had my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought. 
Another hand. Yeah. For the Edgeworth box, what is the trade that would occur close to that? Hold on, that's a different question. On this question. Yeah. Government regulation, that's a good answer, but no, that wasn't what I think it was. Would it be possible if the marginal cost curve was like far out to the right, so it would never introduce that kind of thing? Is that when it would reduce the thing? Far out to the right, because the marginal costs are too low or too high. Too low, too high. So it's too high, yeah. Cost is greater than, than benefit in a sense, so no. I was going to say, I think marginal costs, if you're saying marginal costs, marginal costs. Okay, that's um, you're you're getting at what I'm trying, what I was thinking of when I asked this thing. There's obviously you can't make any money, so you won't do it. So that's a good answer, and that's a fair answer. But the thing I was thinking about is the fixed costs of actually getting going are too high. Okay, you control the market. Like I could go out there right now and completely control the market for coffee on that roundabout. Okay, but maybe it's going to cost me fifteen thousand dollars to get a stand set up in compliance with all of the UC and the Berkeley. Regulation. So the fixed cost might be greater than any potential profit. So I actually don't start up, even though I control the market. Okay. So it's a bit of a weird question, but that was just to make you think. And apparently some people were thinking, so that's good. And there's another question about uh, Edgeworth Box. Yeah? What is the trade that would occur at both of them? It should be somewhere to always go. What's the trade that would occur that? Harms both of them. Harms both of them? Is that one of the questions? Yeah, these are more closely or soft. Show where they're both worse off. So show where they're both worse off without getting into the particulars of that question because I don't have the thing in front of me or the numbers. If you have a starting point that's like this, and this is the area of mutual benefit, then this area, for example, is mutual unbenefit, right? Harm if you want. Right? So there are there are gains from trade in this area here. But you, you only, the only place you want to move to make things the same or better off is into that football area. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? No? Okay. So, um, someone in office hours, they, they brought up this whole thing about um, the whole donate your car to charity thing. You've heard those radio advertisements. Send, give us your car. Save the whales, right? So, I wanted to um, just review that as a good example of kind of... When you have the boundary, where you're, when I'm talking about the theory of the firm, you're talking about who's in the firm and who's outside the firm, right? You want to have people in the firm when? When does it make sense to grow your firm and kind of absorb this outside supplier? <laughs> you can tattoo. Marginal benefit greater than marginal cost. Why? Come on, silent majority. Sorry, sorry. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna bring the duck in. This is gonna get dangerous. Whoever holds the duck has to answer the question. <laughs> Can I start? Come on, somebody. Did you learn anything in this class? Am I just talking? Apparently, I'm just talking. I'll wait. That's cool. So, if the margin cost is low, can't like uh, you can use the leftover to buy it off, like? Not exactly. Why would this why would this firm, Mr. A, absorb Mr. B? What's the what's the cost benefit? What's the additional cost? Reduce its fixed cost. Sorry? Reduce its fixed cost. The benefit so the benefit could be a smaller fixed cost in the sense of like lower this uh, H a, a smaller overhead. They're all under the same roof. Yes, that's a benefit. What's the cost of bringing them in? Sorry, I was gonna say competitive advantage. Comparative advantage? Not exactly. That's Edgeworth box stuff. What else? Yeah. Like wage, we have to hire additional people. So there's a cost of putting that, paying that person, in a sense, right? Because they're coming into the firm. That's that's fine. That's a cost, all right? There could be a cost of bringing them in. There could be a cost of merging and, and getting your corporate cultures in line. I mean, this is like you know, this is mergers and acquisitions or mergers and executions, as they say in uh, American psycho. Um, I don't quite understand what that example, and because a lot of times what really happens is that they buy a company, but they um, somebody buys another company, but they don't actually merge in the sense that they now don't have one new building. They just leave the old one, oftentimes under that name, right. with the same people running right. it. Right. So what's the benefit? Um, in those situations, there's a, a couple different examples. One, they might just leave it completely standalone, and just essentially say, "We just want your cash flow." Right? 
and we're, we're a big enough investor, like for the market is undervaluing your shares, we will buy your shares, and our payback is two years. Something ridiculous, right? This is the way I just, uh, uh, Bear Stearns was trading for $170 a share before the whole financial disaster, then it went down to two, right? That's a big drop. And then, um, it's a Morgan Chase, I guess, they bought them up for 10, right? So if you pay, if you pay, five cents on the dollar for an asset, it might be worth it. That's, that's one explanation. The other explanation is that maybe the parent company has a, uh, even though the, 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 the child company is operating autonomously, maybe they have access to cheaper finance for the parent company. Maybe there's some kind of uh, cross-pollination. But usually what they say is, we're going to you know, get these uh, uh, economies of scale. We'll throw out the HR department in the old place. We'll get rid of one of the presidents and one of the boards of directors. Stuff like that. That tends to be what's explained. So what? So you're gonna, your firm is going to expand if the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. There's cost to growing in here. But also, if you think about this, think of a relationship between a a, um, a supplier, you know, say Walmart or whatever, and they're buying carrots from the carrot company, and they say, you know what? We're not quite sure about the quality of these carrots. Let's buy the carrot company, and then we can be the monitors of our own quality. So we don't worry about what's called asymmetric information. Okay? The carrot company knows more than we do about the quality of their carrots, but if they're a member, if they're a division in our company, then we can get in their books and we can find out what's going on. So there's this idea that you can solve an information problem by merging these two firms together and essentially joining their the, the, the information, making it easier to access the information. Because now that these guys are part of this company, they don't have an incentive to lie about what's going on. This is a, essentially in, in strategy. Now, how does this relate to the car donation problem? Here's what happens. You get the guy with the car. You've got to make the car. I suck at drawing. That's why I'm a comic. There's a car. It's got wheels. All right, so there's your car, right? And the guy says, my car is a piece of crap. I think it's worth about a thousand bucks. But I can donate it to the donation boys. So they, they'll, they'll say, there's, um, send us your car and we will give you a piece of paper and you can fill out on the piece of paper how much the car is worth for your tax deduction. This is actually how it works. So of course you write, a, a very sensible number, like $5,000. And then you send that to who? To get your tax deduction? <coughs> to the IRS. And everybody hates the IRS. They're evil. So then, you get your $5,000 piece of paper. Now this car donation people, this is where it starts to get more interesting, they take your car and they put it in an auction where the actual value of the car is realized because you have buyers and sellers in a competitive market. And guess what? The car is actually worth $500 because as most car owners, this guy is diluted, right? And the $500 gets split 70-30. 70% goes to the, uh, the, do the, sh the donor company, uh, company and 30% goes to the charity. That's $150. Okay? These guys get $350. Now, let's look at the incentives here. Now, remember this $5,000 deduction. Although this guy has a $1,000 car, he happens to be in the 30% marginal tax bracket. So that's worth $1,500 in reduced taxes. Does everybody understand that logic? If you deduct it from your income, your $100,000 income, you deduct, and you would pay $30,000 of taxes, you deduct $5,000 of income, that's the deduction, the difference between a deduction and a tax credit, and then you only pay uh, 100 will get you 30K, 95 will get you uh, 28.5 in tax. Everybody understand that? If you don't, you 
It should. It's important. When someone says they're giving you a tax credit versus a tax mm -hmm. deduction, it's really important. There's a huge difference between the two of them. That's why the rental tax credit in California is kind of nice. Okay, so here we have one, two, three, four, five different players. Okay, and there's some asymmetric information flowing around this diagram. Where is one asymmetric information relationship? Somebody. How much the car is worth? Between, okay, between, how much the car is worth between who and who? Uh, the owner and, um, the, I guess, the auction. Yes, okay, there's one. Where's another one? Where's another asymmetric information? Owner and IRS. What? The car is worth? Yeah. Or, um... I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go with, I'm gonna do it this way, right? The owner thinks it's worth a thousand, for example, right? But he says five thousand. That, that's asymmetric, right? So the owner is essentially lying to the IRS. What's another one? The price of the place, the hundred dollar price of the car. So who knows this and who doesn't know this? Who should know it? The IRS. Yeah. The IRS, and essentially. Well, yeah, let's just do it this way. I think we'll start with those three relationships, okay? Now, let's look at the, at the system and why it might perpetuate and cycle and continue. Does a car donor like this scenario? Yes, right? My $1,000 car, which is really a $500 car, is worth $1,500 to me. Check. Does a charity like this scenario? Get something for nothing, right? Good, 150 bucks. I don't care, you know. It's well, anyway, go ahead. The donor company, do they like this scenario? Yes. Yes, they make some money. The auction house, forget that. That's just a that's just a marketplace. IRS. Do they like this scenario? No. No. But they've got a big problem of asymmetric information, right? And they don't know what the car is worth. They've got to take this guy's worth word for it. And, uh, and even inside the IRS, we've got the people who love taxpayers, love, love, the, 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 uh, what do you call it? love the country, and you've got people that love uh, their jobs. The people that love their jobs really don't necessarily care. They're just like, where was moving paper around? $5,000 deduction came in today, put it on that account, okay, next, you know, that's the kind of thing. People that love their country are like, damn it, we just got ripped off by ourselves, right? Because we wrote the law, right? This is the problem. So these guys are really kind of upset. In terms of people inside the firm, this is inside the firm, right? We're talking about the dynamics. IRS is not a monolith. These guys, guess what? How long are these people going to work at the IRS? Like 20 minutes, right? If at all. They go to, they, they go to do their initial interview and they walk in and they go, oh my God. I was just in Fresno is the headquarters for IRS in the West Coast. And, you know, they made it a sexy town. So then, the people who love their jobs, they don't give a shit. They're just like, yeah, whatever, our paperwork, here we go. So what happens is, essentially, this system will continue. This will go on until the end of time, right? Because, essentially, no one has an incentive to change it. And the people that are really screwed are us, right? The taxpayers. Because... This guy is not paying as many taxes as he could. He's basically sending in a, uh, he's sending in, uh, you know, for, uh, instead of sending it, his saying that your tax obligation is 100 bucks, it's like, hey, uh, here, take 10 bucks. That's good enough, isn't it? That's, that's called avoiding taxes. How would, how would you categorize the, the loss revenue to the IRS? This stuff here? Um, um, the the difference between the actual value and the, the 5,000. Right. Um, I would categorize as losses due to fraud. Have you ever put like ridiculously high numbers for their car worth? Like you put like fifty thousand? You think they would audit you? You mean that kind of question? Yeah. Um, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if someone put fifty thousand. I wouldn't be surprised if they got away with it. I don't know. I've I've never tried it. IRS audits are when they audited me, they ended up paying me more money than I paid them, but um, they usually don't go very well. Question, Han? Yeah, is there, so there's no limitation as to how much you can put into that 
I don't know. I think I, I would I would guess. I mean, look, I bought and sell cars. So you know, you you buy a car, and what's the price you write on the slip you send to the DMV? It's like lower than the price you pay because you're paying a sales tax. I don't know. If anybody's honest on that, good there's on you. There's but just I, I always lie. There's just stuff. Stop doing what? Um, taking people's word for it. I think what they do is they take the market value regardless. Oh, IRS. Um, DMV. DMV. I, well, I've never heard of that. I haven't seen that happen. That's what I heard. Yeah. Isn't a rumor. Isn't there any way the IRS can get um, the information from the auction? Yes, this would be a very logical thing to do. You have to. You don't send in this form. You send in this slip here. It gets automatically reconciled through the VIN. It would be a piece of cake. But it doesn't happen. I don't know. I think you should suggest that. You know, you might be the director of the IRS and nothing flat. <laughs> but that's that's the way that it has been. Uh, the way I understand it right now. But your idea is eminently sensible. Yeah. Um, you know the Yes, there is a cap on tax deductible donations, and you have to itemize as well. I mean, I thought in the end it wasn't worth it to donate because you didn't get much of a deduction. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not interested in doing it, but some people, I mean, the thing is that I think most people just do it because they just want to get rid of that car. They don't care what it's worth. So it's not really, if they don't, you just want to get rid of the car, they don't, they don't even care what number they write down. So it's, it's just, I'm just pointing out that the incentive, the, not the incentive, but the, the it's possible to be fraudulent, right, in this situation. All right, so that's an example of asymmetric information that we're trying to, that the, 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 the theory of the firm is trying to deal with, trying to bring that information inside the firm. This would be, for example, the IRS running the auction, or they could just take that information. So what happens if the car doesn't sell at the auction? Oh. I guess that would be it. Well, it'll sell for scrap for 50 bucks, basically. Uh, my car broke down. I said, oh, I'll give 50 bucks. I was like, ah, for a car? I should have taken the money, actually. It's worth less than $50. So. <laughs> it's kind of sad. All right, let's go do the learner index. The learner index is an index of market power of a firm. Okay, so let's say... We have a firm they have this demand curve and they have a marginal cost of zero. Okay? given a designation of a theta, but who cares, okay? You just have to know what the learner index is. If this was a perfectly competitive firm, what would be, what would be the price in that market? Uh, it's a perfectly competitive, yeah. Well, firm. If this firm, if the firm, if it's a perfectly competitive market, what would be the, oh, If this firm was behaving as a perfect competitor, let's say it that way, what would the price be? I understand. Yeah, but but I'm trying to make it in dollars. What would the price be on this based on this? Zero, right? Because why? Marginal cost is zero. So price taker, price equals marginal cost, right? So to be there selling one unit at a price of zero, zero. Minus zero over zero is equal to zero. Now that sounds kind of stupid, but let's wait and see until we do a monopoly. What a, what a monopoly? What would a monopoly do in this case? What would the price be? Hmm? One over zero. Now, what does a monopolist do when they're deciding how to approach the market? What curve do they look at? The demand curve or the? Good. Marginal revenue curve is this one, right? There's the intercept. What's the intercept tell you on this in this firm? 
Why would they produce one half? What happens at one half? Right, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's the quantity, but what's the price going to be? One half, right? One half minus zero over one half equals one. Okay? So the learner index is a, is, has values in the range of zero and one. Now, if you had in, imperfect competition, not perfect competition, but also not a monopoly, where would the price be? Somewhere between zero and one half, right? If you have imperfect competition, you can, you can understand it any way you want. We're not even going to bother to do the math, okay? You would tend to have a price that would be greater than the price with perfect competition and lower than the price of monopoly. It'll be somewhere in this range, right? Where will the learner index be for those firms in, perfect, in, in, in imperfect competition? Between zero and one, right? Because you'll have a price of whatever, you know, one third. Oh, see that? I'm not doing one third, so hold on. I think it's because I have this zero marginal cost here. I'm in trouble. Take my word for it. It's between, between, be between zero and one. Let me do an example where there is a cost, and that might make more sense. It is true it's between zero and one, but I'm trying to Mickey Mouse this thing. Okay, so um, let's do a let's give this firm a cost function of c is equal to q squared. Marginal cost is equal to what? If c is equal to q squared, marginal cost is 2q. Now I'm going to put a price taker because I couldn't put a price taker with a marginal cost of zero because then I'd have two horizontal lines and nothing would ever happen, right? They wouldn't cross. So let's do a price taker. p is equal to 1. This is for the this is for the perfectly competitive firm, okay? <coughs> MC is equal to two Q, right? Quantity is going to be for a per, for a perfectly competitive firm, the quantity is going to be one half. And we've got P minus mc over p, we've got 1 minus, marginal cost is what? Marginal cost for that firm of that production quantity, 1. Back to 0. Okay, learner index still works, but let's look at a monopoly. This is more realistic, okay, but I just wanted to get you, I want to show you that this range goes up to 1. But a monopoly would have Let's just say the same demand function that goes to one. Crap. I didn't draw that very well. So the marginal revenue curve, of course, slopes down like that. And what's the quantity produced? P equals one minus Q. Marginal revenue equals one minus. 2Q, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. What's it going to be? <coughs> right? Q is equal to 1 4, right? <coughs> Price is equal to 
what? Three fourths, right? Because this is our demand function here. This is where the algebra is faster than the graph, right? The graph shows what's going on with the algebra. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So now we're going to get price is equal to three quarters. So we got three quarters minus the marginal cost at Q is equal to one quarter is what? One half divided by three fourths. Okay, so we get one fourth over three fourths equals one third. That's just working out. That's working with the learner index. Okay, so the only the only thing that you can say about one third is that it's smaller than one half, it's smaller than one, it's bigger than zero. That's fine, but it's just showing you the amount of market power. Okay, as the as the, the margin between price and marginal cost gets squeezed down, it gets squeezed down. What's gonna? What's the? What does that mean about market power? So I have a question. Yeah. Um, how did you get for um, how do you get one minus two q equals two q? Marginal revenue is one minus two q, and two q is what? Marginal. Marginal cost. Oh, that's oh, because he's a capital. Term. Right. Oh yeah. No, I'm not trying to say one is equal to two. No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was talking and not writing. So what happens? What's, what's going on here with, with market power and stuff like that? What's happening when the price marginal cost margin is getting squeezed? Well, you that again? The price marginal cost margin? The price marginal cost margin, right? The difference between price and marginal cost. Let's use margin three times in one sentence, right? What's happening there? What's going on? Market power is falling. Market power is falling, okay? This index is explicitly telling you that market power is falling. How is it falling? There's more competition. Okay? So, and what happens in the long run? Where does that go? Zero, right? In the long run, you so you have this firm, they're sitting fat and pretty with the one-third learner index value, and then a firm enters and it goes down to a quarter, it goes down to an eighth, and it goes down, bang, bang, bang. After a while, it goes down to zero. Because all of the entry of all of the other firms trying to get a piece of the action, trying to get those profits, push down the price, push down the price until it reaches marginal cost, right? And then we get one of these situations like that. What are, those, what are the labels that go on those curves? Who remembers what those curves represent? Average cost, what's, the, what's this one? Right? In the long run, the price is gonna the price is gonna fall down until it's just touching here on the bottom of the average cost curve, right? Zero profits, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That is a long run perfect equilibrium under perfect comp or equilibrium under perfect competition. Yeah. So two different monopolies for different products, do they have a different um, Power, or do they, is it like as soon as it's a monopoly, it's always one? Oh, no, no. No, the one, the one is when you have a margin cost of zero, right? Okay. So that's kind of an extreme case. Or, you know, the, the price is. compared to the cost is so different, right? So you can look at this in terms of um, Saudi Arabia uh, has a production cost of about $10 a barrel of oil, right? When they were getting $140 a barrel, Right, minus ten for the marginal cost. They had they had market power in a sense because they were just they could they didn't they didn't have to uh, lower their price. They were facing the market so world price, that, and it was very competitive. That also means that uh, a monopoly that is not able to bring their marginal cost much below the price is not a very powerful market. It doesn't have much market power. No, because you're not even taking advantage of your monopoly power. If you can't make fat profits, then why bother? That's like why start a company. You have a, you have monopoly power, but you don't even start production, right? Because it's ridiculous. You can't make any money. Okay. Does this make sense, you guys? Any questions about this? No. Okay. Let's do the uh, monopsony thing. Boy.
So the word phenopsony, according to the amazing reference thing called Wikipedia, the word phenopsony is a neologism, I think is the expression, right? It's supposed to be Greek, but the Greeks never used the word. What does it mean?
Higher or lower? Who thinks it's going to be higher? The way to be higher. Who thinks the way to be lower? Everybody's watching. It's like, what's the Okay, why? Simple answer. Control. What? What's the what's the answer? Use our jargon. No, that's why. That's why why. But what's why? Talk about bad jargon. Come on. Market power, right? Come on, you guys. Now, how do we how do we diagram the market power? All right, I'm just going to give you a hint. It's going to go like that. And this, I'm going to call. What do I tell you right now? No. So this is the cost curve, and I'm going to call this the marginal cost curve. All right. And don't freak out because I just use marginal cost for not a supply curve, but that's what it's going to be. It's the it's the marginal cost because if you're the if you have market power and you're the only buyer, then what you pay one person is what you pay all of them, right? So if you pay one person a lower wage, you pay all of them a lower wage, or a higher wage, you pay all of them a higher wage. So your your wage, your price, uh, your total wage bill is going to go up a lot faster, let me say it this way, what you would want to do is, is pay this person this little wage and then hire another person, right, and say, oh, this person not, is not worth very much, but this person's worth more, I'll pay them two different wages, but you're not allowed to do that under the construction that we have here. So as soon as you pay this person a higher wage, you've got to pay this person the same higher wage. So your total wage bill is going up a lot faster than just that, the marginal, that marginal laborer. It's the exact same situation as a monopolist because as soon as they, if they set um, a price here and they want to sell another unit to this guy, they have to set a lower price for everybody, okay? And that lowers their revenue for everybody. That's why there's this marginal revenue curve. That's the derivation, the theory behind the marginal revenue curve. This is a marginal cost curve from exactly the same logic. Now that you know that, what's, what's the wage going to be? In fact, calculate the wage. Everybody spend a minute calculating the wage for this firm. You know everything you need to know. You can check with your neighbors and see if they're right or you're wrong. Or you're wrong, you're right, and they're wrong. when you guys learn a lot and when I'm not talking, so stop it. So what's uh, W going to be? Or sorry, to start again. What do we care about? What point here, A or B? B. B. Great. What's happening at B? What's happening at B? Marginal benefit equals marginal cost, all right? So I got two, I got two equations here. Is this what, so, so somebody want to tell me the answer or what's going to happen? I'm going to have two equations, right? 2L is equal to 1 minus L. L is equal to 1 third. L is equal to 1 third. And the wage is going to be equal to what? One third. Right? You already told me it's going to be less than the market clearing wage. Use your intuition to check your mathematics. <laughs> this is the, we're on the buy side now. Everything is upside down because we're not going, we're not going up, we're going down. Right? Market power on the monopsony is to push down the price you pay, not increase the price that you receive. That's a monopoly. Yeah. Um, in the monopsony, why is the demand curve still downward sloping and not a straight line down? Because if you have one buyer, he knows exactly, she knows exactly how much they will need of one good. It's not like, oh, I'm going to make more. No, it does. No, they do have a downward sloping demand curve because they, they want to decide how much they're going to buy based on their production side. 
So for them, that labor is an input for something that's an output. Right? So you might have monopsony power on the buy side, but you might be facing the market on the sell side. Right? It's essentially, we don't know. I'm just assuming Dow is going to demand. So if you were a monopoly and also monopsony, then you would have a downward sloping. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, not a downward sloping, and you have a straight line. I, honestly, I don't know. I would say it would be downward sloping because you still um, have a variable production function on the sell side. I'm just going to guess that, but it don't, don't write it in stone, right? It, it, let's just say, it's a, let's just not worry about it because it doesn't happen, right? But if you're buy side and sell side monopolist, you know, that's kind of cool as far as profits are concerned. All right, so does that make sense? Does everybody understand why it's one third? Yes? As in, I can do this on the test, that kind of understanding? It won't be one third on the test, okay? Don't just write down the same number. Okay. I'm going to be all tricky and everything. Okay, that's a monopsony, yeah. Um, I, I, it's probably like order numbers, but why, why do you use wage and labor? I guess, to it's just, uh, just because if you're, um, it's, a, it's a, just the example, okay? If you're a monopsonist, then you are buying something. Now, if you're buying a product, it's kind of confusing because we're talking about price and quantity, but it happens a lot, you know, for example, that you're, um, the monop the, the, uh, a typical example of monopsonists might be a firm in a company town, right? Like uh, General Motors in Flint, Michigan. It's like, we are the only game in town. You, we pay you what we think we're, we're going to pay you, right? Now, what's, what's the counterbalancing, the countervailing force to a monopsonist, especially a General Motors type of monopsonist? The union. the union, right? So the unions essentially were formed to combat this problem, right? It was a problem for the workers. It was not a problem for General Motors or the other companies that don't like unions. And what happens when you have General Motors versus the UAW in a negotiation? You have what's called a bilateral monopoly. And just to, we're probably going to put as many lines as possible on this page. But I'm just going to, I'm giving you this in principle, okay? So a monopolist, now we're doing P and Q. We'll do it this way. P or W. We're putting all these things on the axes, but they're essentially the same kinds of uh, variables, okay? A monopolist has a demand curve and has a marginal revenue curve, correct? If they have... A supply. Oh, well, now we're getting confused. There's the a monopoly. Well, a monopolist is going to be working on the marginal revenue curve, okay? And a monopsonist is going to be working on the marginal cost curve. What's the other two? I just still like demand. Yeah, this is demand and supply. And I'm just, I'm going to be really vague about, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm talking about units of, of labor or what, but let's, let's get monopsonist. Monopsonist is, this is what's going on with GM. And a monopolist is, this is what's going on with the UAW. Does the UAW represent grad students at Berkeley? Yeah? I always thought that was funny. Like, grad student union, UAW. Um, United Auto Workers, if you didn't know that. So this is the stuff that, this is the area where General Motors is making their decision, and this is the area where the UAW is making their decision. Okay? Now, if both of them were essentially were price takers, just for, this, for the moment, where would, where, they were acting, behaving as price takers, where would the, the wage be? Where would the wage be? I've got a lot of letters here. A, B, C, and D. What intersection? D. D, right? This is essentially a W star or a, a perfectly competitive wage, right? If the UAW had all of the power, where would... UAW had all of the power, what intersection matters to the UAW? If they have all the power and GM has none? 
equals C. C matters because that's where marginal, marginal cost equals marginal benefit for them. Okay? So the wage would be higher. Upper bar, right? If GM had all the power and UAW had no power, where's the intersection of interest? Not C. And not D. It's B and then D. Okay? Marginal benefit equal marginal cost. Okay? W under bar. Now you see that this is a slightly confusing diagram. Okay? But what it's meant to demonstrate mainly is that when all the power is on one side, you're going to get a higher wage. The UAW will get a higher wage. If it's over here, the UAW is going to get a lower wage. That makes, does that make sense intuitively? Okay, that's what I want you to understand. But here's the thing that's tricky. We actually don't know where it's going to end up between those two points. Because there's 100% market power on one side and 100% market power on the other side, right? We don't know. Because we can't say that this is going to happen because the other guys do have market power. And we can't say that this is going to happen because the other guys do have market power. So the wages will end up somewhere in between. And unfortunately, A is not going to help us. Okay? So it's essentially, it's a, 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 mathematically, it's unknown. Right? But we know that it's going, to, it's going to be somewhere in the middle here. Literally based on bargaining now. It's not based on price taking. It's based on, you know, you give me a health insurance plan and I'll work for you. Uh, 42 hours a week, that kind of thing. So that bargaining outcome is going to be somewhere in this range, but we don't know exactly where it's going to be. And we don't have to know. That's, that's all you need to know is it's going to be somewhere in between. And it, it does depend on relative market power. So it might end up here when GM is strong because GM is able to push down wages. And it might end up higher when the UAW is strong. Does that make sense from an intuitive perspective? You can walk out and do that on the streets. Yeah? And trust your parents? Okay, that's bilateral monopoly. Any questions about that? No? Just endless excitement. Okay. My second most favorite, my, one of my favorite topics, price discrimination. Oh, let's, um, let's, I want to quickly get to this thing because it's been hanging over my head for weeks. The, the, the two-sided market example. Say that you have a firm, and this diagram is going to look a little weird, so it's the first time you've seen it. The firm has got a marginal cost of one to produce widgets. And this is one market going over to the left, and this is a different market going to the right. Okay? It's not negative. This is, this is all positive, and this is positive, but they're different markets. Okay? It's the same firm. They have the choice of deciding how much to sell into each of those two different markets. And this example, I put C for Canada and A for America, because I'm thinking of like um, one, of these, you know, one of these firms that sits there and sells pharmaceuticals on both sides of the, of the border. So let's say that we've got, there, but this firm is facing two different demand functions. That's the, the tricky part. One demand function, 4 minus 2 QA. <coughs> minus one half QC. The firm is a monopolist. Okay? 
If it wasn't monopolist, what would the price be? You. If it was not a monopolist, what would the price be? Where are marginal costs is today? You're answering her question. <laughs> Try again. What would the, if, it, if the firm was perfectly competitive, what would the price be? Sorry? I didn't hear you. Uh, in fact, both. It's a behavior as a price taker. It's just going to have a price of one, right? Marginal cost, right? Price equals marginal cost. Price taker, right? But if it's a monopoly, what is it going to do? It's going to look at what curves. All right, marginal revenue. What's the price going to be in? Once you guys work it out, what are the price? And talk to your friends. What are the price going to be in QC and Q uh, in market A and market C? Go ahead and take a minute. And whatever. Whoever gets an answer, the fifth person to raise their hand. Uh -huh. Okay, so who's got a quantity in market C? What's the quantity? Two. What's the price? Two. Two? Is that right? I didn't do the work. You guys tell me. Is that right? Yes. 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 Okay. In market A, what's the quantity? Three fourths. Three fourths. And what's the price? I can plug it in. What are you going to do? Plug it in. What's the price? 2.5. 2.5, right? So the price in market A is higher than the price in market C. I'm assuming that work is correct. Does anybody have any questions about that work? Finding Anybody finding a different answer than that? No? Okay. So the whole point of this exercise is that the same firm in two markets is going to charge two different prices, it's a monopoly, charging two different prices to take advantage of the market power and to reflect the actual demand functions, okay? The price might vary because of essentially the, the characteristics of the market, not because of some kind of random number generator. It doesn't mean they're not bad or whatever, it's a monopoly, but that's what they're doing, yeah. <coughs> How do we get the numbers? On both each time we said marginal price is equal, or marginal benefit equals marginal cost or marginal revenue. The marginal revenue curve is three minus QC. That's marginal revenue, not the demand curve. So I'm just taking double the slope, right? So three minus QC is the marginal revenue curve is equal to one. So I mean the QC is equal to four. No. Yes. No. It's two. Am I doing it wrong? Yeah. Oh, it's equal to two because I can't subtract. Okay, Q is equal to two, and the demand curve is three minus minus one half times two is equal to two. That's our price, right? That's how that gets. Yeah, that's how you do it. Find out quantity, then find the price off of the demand curve. The exact same thing on the other side of the. Of the In this 
one here. 4 minus, yeah, 4 QA equals 1. Subtract as a 3. Put that over there, 3 fourths equals QA. Right? And if you plug it in, you find your price. This stuff you should be able to do in your sleep. Sorry, so what does the marginal benefit come in? Marginal benefit, marginal revenue, same word. Oh. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Now we can sit there and say, well, what if the firm was a price taker in one market and a monopolist in another market, and they essentially they would treat the markets as the same? Given that I have this flat marginal cost curve, okay, given they can essentially produce infinite at that price of one. If marginal costs were rising in both markets, then they would have to jiggle between, uh, if they, because of joint, uh, because of production is occurring in one spot, then they might have to um, pay attention to two different, uh, that's just complicated. If marginal costs were rising, they would pay attention to the overall cost curve against overall revenue, right? Which means revenue from two different sources. So it would be slightly more complicated. Okay, any other questions on this stuff or any other stuff I talked about so far today? Alright, I'm going to let you out early and see you on Tuesday.